We specialize in the Polish World War II experience, publishing it in English. That covers first-hand um, memoirs, some histories, artwork, um, you know, whatever the story is, because this is probably the most heroic and tragic story of any of the Allies during World War II. And, you know, I am not Polish at all. Uh, my own background is Armenian. I was actually drawn to this story uh, when I was doing research for a novel. And um, I had made a character a Polish fighter pilot in World War II because I had heard somewhere that the Polish fighter pilots were these super ace pilots that helped save England during the Battle of Britain. And not knowing any more about it, I went over to our local library and started doing research. And I was reading memoirs of key resistance leaders during the war. Um, and I just became so moved and inspired by the stories that I was reading. I had no idea of what actually went on in Poland during the war. I didn't even know there was a Polish underground. I didn't know the extent of the Polish resistance. I didn't understand uh, until I started doing this research that the entire Polish government went underground. It wasn't just some little cells. It was the entire government structure, both the civil side, that was the courts and the schools and, you know, the administration, and the military side, which was the Armia Krajowa, the, the home army. The average life of an AK soldier was three to four months, but they never lacked for volunteers. And that, it's, it's the most heroic story um, the Poles never gave up, even though they were operating under really insurmountable odds. I mean, they had the, the Gestapo and the SS were after them all the time. Torture, execution, sent off to, you know, concentration camps. Um, anyway, it's an amazing story. It's just, it's a huge canvas, a huge story, and it's not known, certainly in the United States, generally, um, and I think the reason is pretty clearly in one word was Stalin because he knew in order to control Poland after the war he actually uh, he used a kind of a two-prong attack uh, one was physical terror where he would um, arrest torture execute deport to Siberia anyone that he thought capable of opposing the communist regime which meant most of the resistance leaders and most of the resistance fighters during World War II because they didn't want to be taken over by the communists any more than they wanted to be taken over by the Nazis. Um, and secondarily, and this is perhaps more important for today, uh, he had a very sophisticated and subtle propaganda campaign um, that was aimed at discrediting and marginalizing the Polish resistance leaders and the Polish resistance, independent Poland, uh, in the international community as well as within the country itself. I think that obviously has changed as the communism has you know, been gone for more than 20 years. You've got a whole new generation, and now Poland is really re, um, resurrecting that history and really celebrating it and really you know, bringing it out into the open. And there's so much to be proud of, really so much to be proud of. They are larger than life heroes. These guys were amazing. And if you see the photos of them, they're handsome, they're standing, they're posing in their fur-lined leather jackets against the planes, and they're just, you know, incredible guys. 303 Squadron was the highest scoring Allied fighter squadron in the entire Battle of Britain in, in that most critical month of September 1940, which was the height of the Battle of Britain, kind of the make or break month when the Germans had their infantry loaded in the barges on the coast of France, just waiting for the Luftwaffe to knock out the RAF so they could get across the channel. 303 Squadron downed 108 enemy aircraft. The next highest scoring RAF squadron, which was a British one, downed only 48. So they, the, the Poles were more than twice as effective as any of the other squadrons in the RAF, and on an average basis, on an average basis, they downed three times the average RAF squadron with only one-third the casualties. Now that record alone has got to get your attention. And in fact, during the Battle of Britain, they got a lot of attention. They, beca they literally became a legend in their own time. They were written up in newspapers. The King, uh, King George VI, came to visit them several times. They had all of these telegrams sent to them. In fact, 
there's a, a cute story that after the, I don't know, fifth, sixth, whatever telegram congratulating them, their uh, commanding officer telegraphed back to the, wh whichever war department it was in England and said, telegrams are nice, but uh, a case of whiskey would be better appreciated. <laughs> and, and they promptly got a case of whiskey the next time. So they were trained to be literally an o officer and a gentleman. And so it was very important for them to have the right presence. And um, uh, Witold Urbanovich, who was their commanding officer and the leading Polish ace during the Battle of Britain, his son now lives in New York, and he was telling us that his father had all of his suits made at Savile Row. And of course, th the Poles were very um, gentlemanly and gracious with the women. They kissed their hands when they met, and that's a very traditional Polish thing. But for the British women, that was something new. And I have to tell you, as an American woman, the first time I went to Poland and I had an elder, older Polish gentleman do that, I was like very charmed. It's a, you know, it works. So for your, you know, young men, you know what? It works. Flowers work and <laughs> kissing the lady's hand, you know? Anyway, so they were, um, I think the numbers are what set them apart, you know, really. And, and that's what gets your attention. But also, th they were handsome, young, daredevil. Heroic, you know, all the all the stuff of, of legend. I was drawn to form this company because I didn't know anything about this. This is a story that n deserves to be better known, and so I think my hope would be that we would be able to reach the broader English-speaking audience to make. Poland's role in World War II, as well known as the U.S., as England, as France, um, you know, in a sense, it's the missing piece of the Allied story of World War II, and it deserves to be part of that story. I, I mean, the Poles fought on the Allied side from the very first day of World War II to the very last day of the war in Europe. Um, actually, many people don't understand this or don't realize it, but Poland fielded the fourth largest Allied military force in the European theater of war during World War II, after um, the US, England, and Russia, but ahead of France. Um, so, you know, and the Poles fought both within Poland, inside the country, they fought against the occupation, and outside the country they had um, the Polish army, the first, uh, I think it's the first corps was based in, in England, um, the Air Force, there were even some Polish Navy, um, some of the Polish Navy ships were able to get out, um, uh, escape the Nazis. And then of course, you know, here's a whole other part of the story when, um, you know, Germany invaded Poland from the west on September 1st, 1939. On September 17th, two and a half weeks later, the Soviets invaded from the east. And so basically Poland was caught, it was the only allied country invaded by two enemies. Um, and split between Stalin and Hitler. And Stalin then deported a million and a half Polish civilians to Siberia and elsewhere in the wastelands of Russia to forced labor camps. And so there's a whole other story that after Hitler turned on Stalin and invaded Russia in 1941, June of 41, Stalin, as part of the price for joining the Allies, had to release the Poles. And whoever was left, and, and, and frankly, like half the people had died, starvation and overwork and the cold weather and sickness and whatever. Whoever was left and, and could, they, they, they found their way down. They formed uh, the Polish Second Corps under General Anders, who had also been in a Soviet prison. And Polish, he was a Polish general. And the Polish Second Corps trained with the British in the Middle East, in Iraq and Iran and Palestine in those days. And they were the, the uh, corps that actually took Monte Cassino after the other Allied forces had failed three or four times. So that's a whole other piece of the story. And so there's so many stories. And it's, so for, for me, my hope would be to see this story wider, more widely known, to get our books out there, to see films um, based on the stories, you know, and, and um, to, ha to reach students in high school, college level, and to reach the popular media so that really Poland takes its rightful place as one of the allies in World War II.